Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone. And welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. I trust that you all had a great Easter or whatever it is that you celebrate. I don't know about where you are, but here in New York, the sun is shining. It is a gorgeous day outside. And after this interview today, which I am very excited about, I'm going to go for a nice long walk just to enjoy the final remaining rays of today's sun. My show is about celebrating artists and their body of worth. And Wayne Smith, who has been appearing not only as Cher, but other celebrities, which we're going to talk about in a few moments, has been wowing the strip in Texas for over 28 years. And interesting tidbit, I first saw Wayne uh, many years ago, I won't say how many, uh, long before I even appeared as Carol Channing or Judy Garland, which I did for a short while. I went to Atlantic City and I went to Bally's and I saw Lacage. And it was that moment that I decided I wanted to do what they were doing. It was the great costumes. It was what they were doing on stage. It was the fact that they were celebrating these great artists. And that's the thing that I'll say about Wayne. He celebrates these artists. And that's why I wanna celebrate him today. So sit back, enjoy this little montage that Wayne has put together for all of you. And you will all meet Wayne Smith on the other side. Here is Wayne Smith. Better keep your heart out of danger, dear. Such a lovely evening, Janice. Why don't we just walk on down to the restaurant? Why don't you give me your car keys? Well, okay, we can drive if you'd like. And your watch and your wallet. Pardon me? Your watch and your wallet. <laughs> is, uh, is this uh, some, kind of, uh, some kind of joke? Shut your yapper and drop your drawers. What? Your pants. Drop them. <laughs> I'm not going nowhere, I'm staying right here Can't stop me, you won't see me back I'm not taking my back Can't stop me, it's not the end You won't see the last of me 
And there you are, Wayne Smith. Oh my God, I'm so tired after watching that. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I want to say I am so thrilled that you were here. Uh, and we, I, again, how many years ago did I see you at Valley's? I was actually at the Tropicana and that was, that would have been later. That was in like 2000. I was in LA wow. at the show in Hollywood for nine years. See what the, see what the brain does to oh, us? Honey, don't even, do, I, I'm writing my autobiography and I say at the beginning, if somebody can put this in chronological order, I will bring the Nobel Peace Prize to their house. <laughs> But no, you know, it's sure hard. You probably saw me in Hollywood for the very first time in, in LA. That was in the eighties. Yes, yeah, that that's probably it. But I, I mean, you're probably twelve. Uh, well, almost. <laughs> okay, good. Like I said, I'm not good with numbers. No, but Wayne, I mean, first of all, um, today let's put things in perspective as to where we are right now, um, and these numbers just baffle my mind. Three hundred and eighty-eight days ago today our theaters shut down. And that meant performing arts venues uh, from coast to coast shut down. Um, I wanna ask you, how are you doing really in the midst of all this? I mean, you took the bull by the horns and you've created a new niche for yourself, brilliantly I might add, uh, but how are you doing really in the midst of all this? Well, it's it's scary because you, you you have to deal with the people that don't want to think it's real. There are the other people, you know, who I'm talking about. They don't believe it's real. So you have to deal with those people. And you also have to deal with nightclubs that aren't open. Uh, theaters aren't open. So basically what I did is I, I have a karaoke system that I bring to nightclubs. I set it up in my living room here and I did a living room, live living room, Wayne Smith, a share show. And I did concerts and people would request songs. I'd jump down and push the button and sing it. And they would tip me on Venmo and on PayPal and different things. And I was making roughly a thousand dollars a night staying home. So Good you know what? You, you may never you. leave home again. <laughs> I, my husband said, well, if the apartments allow you to do this, I said, well, they haven't complained yet, but it, it's really hard. A lot of my friends still aren't working. Vegas is just starting up now. Like Kenneth mm -hmm. Blake and different ones are just starting to do shows. And I mean, I, I heard New York Broadway was going to come back, I think in July or something is what I heard. Well, right? there's there's hope, but there's still, there's so much red tape mm -hmm. involved uh, that we don't even know about. Uh, oh. That's preventing. Uh, and then, you know, the paradigm of Broadway is set up in such a way that if a show is not at capacity, um, they can't sustain themselves. It's and not, I yeah, don't know. Make the money. Right. I don't know how that's going to be turned around. One thing that you that it really admires me about you, among many other things, Wayne, uh, this is all about celebrating you today. So accept it. Uh, okay. But I uh, Years ago, when I was performing as Carol, um, we ballied around an idea. Um, is that a word? Ballied around? Bandied around an idea. Um, I know where you're going. For a show called As Carol. And the premise of that show was going to be that I would start off the show as Richard Skipper. I would sit at a makeup table and I would begin to put my makeup on in front of an audience. And then the second half of the show would be me performing as Carol. It never happened. And it never happened for a lot of reasons, but the main reason was that I was petrified. I was petrified of being able to sit down, keep my concentration, stay on track, and transform in front of everybody. And you do this on a nightly basis. Um, I, do, how I, do my, I do my thing called Wine Down with Wayne. It started out with a cheesecake flavored wine that got discontinued because I said too much about it and it got sold out. I could never find it. So now it's just a nice drink with Wayne, but I still call it Wine Down with Wayne. And I actually get ready and take questions. I tell stories. I talk about current events and just get my face on and put my wig on and say good night and go do my show. Now, I want to go way back with you. Uh, okay. We're going to try to put everything in chronological order. Uh, but I'm always interested in going back to the childhood. The little boy uh, growing up. You're from Texas, am I correct? Uh, yeah, in Dallas. Okay, in Dallas. Um, what were you like as a five-year-old? Well, when I was a child, most kids played cowboys and Indians. We played Egyptians so I could be Cleopatra. <laughs> And Mark Anthony and Caesar were always the cutest boys on the block. And I made sure that they, you know, were, were, were you know, in love with me. Okay, of course. I'll say this very, you know, politely. But then my main, my big break was in the fourth grade. The fourth grade, I did Lily Tomlin's character, Edith Ann, in a talent show. And I won. 
and now, stand fully, on that stage. Were you fully dressed up as Edith Ann? I had, I had a, my hair in a ponytail, chocolate around my mouth, and I had a terry cloth little onesie outfit on and came out on stage looking for my dog, Buster. And mm -hmm. I was like, Buster, Buster, my dog, Buster, cubs when I whistle. And that was my first joke. <laughs> but that was on the album of Lily Tomlin that my brother had, so I just memorized the, the, the lines and said them. Oh, my and God. So, you like me. on I'm that stage, I knew I was an attention whore. I used to perform on the front steps of my high school and I used to imitate every, that's, that's when it began for me, um, doing all these impressions of other people that I had seen on television the night before. And uh, Edith Ann, uh, I think you and I are uh, maybe give a, take a year or two in the same age range. Uh, but uh, I grew up watching Edith Ann. I used to come in and I'd do the Buster jokes. You know, my mom said that Jesus has a light around his head so that he can read in bed. Right. Yep. <laughs> Those and that, and oh, also the good one. Lady, do you think that is, is pollution in the sky? I think it's angels fried hamburgers. <laughs> That's right. I remember all of them. I, I used to do them so much. So, but that was my main start, really. So, I mean, uh, do you have brothers and sisters? I had a, uh, my brother passed away from skin I'm cancer sorry, really. about 13 sorry, years ago. And... Um, he uh, he was my mentor. He was he was also gay, and he listened to Diana Ross, Barbara Streisand, and I hear that through the walls, and so of course right away I just started liking those kind of things, and and it was just it was pretty much I have a sister. She's older than me. She, I was the baby of the family. My mm -hmm. brother my brother was eleven when I was born. My sister was seventeen, so I was the baby. Well, years ago when I first came to New York, I had a roommate. Uh, Jamie, if you're watching, I miss you, love you. Uh, Jamie was one of 10 children. Wow. And they were all gay. Every they were lucky. They were said, lucky. They're lucky, their parents. I mean, I can only imagine, you know, my own parents and everything. What was it? I mean, what was the experience like for your parents having two gay sons? Were they even then open um, about it? Was it difficult? They, I never really had got any flack for it really too much. My father always told me he was proud of me. Just He said, whatever you are, make me proud. Don't ever make me embarrassed. God bless and him. And he and my mother were both on the very first talk show I ever did was with Geraldo. And my father was the first father of any female impersonator, drag queen, whatever you want to call it, on a talk show. And I was a nervous wreck. My leg was just going, 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 watching back now as Dolly Parton. And Geraldo kissed me on the cheek. He forgot that I was a man. It was like really weird. And he asked my dad, he said, Mr. Smith, you're a good straight Texan. Don't you ever get embarrassed about what your son does? He goes, Geraldo, I'm not embarrassed. He goes, when we go out during the days in sneakers, tennis shoes I wouldn't wear, we run errands. At night, he puts his outfit on. It's like a uniform. And, you know, after a few scotches, they look pretty sexy. And the crowd screams. So I, I was proud of him. Now, did you do any other theater in your hometown? or No, did I really didn't because I was always scared that I was already, I was already pinpointed terribly for being different than all the other kids. So I didn't want to even put more of a spotlight on me. I designed costumes in, uh, for, for drama in high school mm -hmm. and won some of the, the awards you get in high school for that kind of stuff. But I didn't really ever do the acting stuff. I just didn't get involved. Now, and then I did more TV shows dressed in drag at Lacage because they would come to the club and pick, the casting agents would come there to look for somebody mm -hmm. to star in these different parts that were written. So I, I did the Mike Hammer and Stacey Keach. I did W. Carol P. in Cincinnati, the new Adam 12. I was a question yeah. on Hollywood Squares. I did some crazy stuff, but. I'm proud of it all. It was a lot of fun. Well, you should be proud of it. Now, you and I came along at a time where when it, in the world of drag, it was pretty much Jim Bailey, uh, Charles Pierce, right. Craig Russell. Yeah. Uh, these were these men uh, who impersonated famous divas of show business. Right, exactly. And so what RuPaul's drag and everything, that type of drag came much later. When did you first become aware of the world of drag? And how did you break into that world uh, at the very, very beginning for you? Uh, the very beginning, I went with my brother and his friend to a, a nightclub in Los Angeles called La Caja Fall. And we walked into this place and all the waitresses were dressed in drag, really bad, heavy, like bras <laughs> and Inez and you know different names. Then the show started and I looked around the room and there were some celebrities like you know, Johnny Carson and people sitting in the room. And I'm thinking, what is this place? And then Gypsy comes out and Gypsy was bigger than life, bigger than life, funny, still to this day, one of my idols. She's just my, one of my dear friends. I miss Gypsy very much. She just turned 89, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she hosted the show. We got through and I was walking with my brother. And I said, I want to do this. 
He said, you do not want to be a drag queen. And his friend Tommy <laughs> said, leave him alone. If he wants to do it, you let him do it. <laughs> so I did a Halloween show as Marilyn Monroe and, and Bob, I was working at Bob Mackey. I, to kind of do a little rewinding, I worked with Bob Mackey on his uh, Bob Mackey originals. So I would like mark the gowns and, and for the beadwork and I'd make the beaded fringe and what have you. And uh, so he actually helped me with my first costume as Marilyn, the red dress from the Diamonds Are Girls Best Friend and the hat. He had a lady from MGM make the hat. And it was really incredible. And I won best female costume. And somebody mm -hmm. came up and said, you ought to audition for Lacage. They're opening a show in Florida. And I was like, uh, I would be honored to try it. He said, you need two characters. And I was like, oh, who in the world would I do? And my roommate was from the South. He said, do Dolly Parton. She has big titties and I love her. I said, okay, I don't know who she <laughs> hey. is. And I watched a tape of her and Kenny Rogers. I was like, okay, I can do this. So my brother helped me with the costumes. I auditioned and got the part that day for Florida. And that was my first big show in Florida. Now I want to back up for a moment. Uh, yeah. Bob Mackey, that's a that's a big name to drop there. So how yeah. did how did you get involved with Bob Mackey? Yeah. Uh, obviously, you were designing costumes. I mean, was that something that came naturally to you? Uh, I, was, I had I actually opened a store in Beverly Hills for a short period, and I designed some of the gowns that Joan Rivers wore on the Tonight Show when she hosted mm -hmm. for Johnny. And at the end, it said fashions provided by Wayne Marshall of Beverly Hills. My middle name is Marshall. And it's spelled with one L, so it's kind of odd because it's like mm -hmm. a martial law. But um, so I just always sketched dresses. I loved it. I, lo I always watched Sonny and Cher. And I, I, when the show was over, I'd say, oh, this is what she could wear next week. And it looked, it was something. It wouldn't even, wouldn't even be sewn up probably. But it was, in my mind, it would look great on her. So I really got the idea to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, approved to go to Fashion Institute of Mer Merchandise, Fashion Design, F I Fedum, I Institute of Design and Merchandising in L.A. And he was on the board of directors. And we had to do a fashion show. Well, I was going to do a beaded gown and I did a gown with a peacock bird on the front and a big train, all peacock tail beaded and went to the same bead company that he did his bead work at. He and Nolan Miller from Dynasty and all the shows. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And that's where I met Bob. And then I was asked to work at Helen's and I came to work with Helen and Bob for his line. Well, how did you make the move from uh, Dallas to uh, Beverly Hills? Quickly. And were there any stops between? Uh, no, you know, quickly, getting... quickly. Quickly, I was I was damned in school. The counselor called me in the very last day. She said, Wayne, I understand you have a problem. I said, no, I'm gay and people here have a problem with it. But I'm moving to LA and there's a couple more out there. I think I'll be okay. <laughs> so they literally called you into the guidance counselor's office. Mrs. Pascal, I will never forget her. Now, did you make them, uh, did you, had you already made the decision that as soon as I'm out of here, I'm out of, I'm out oh, of here? Oh, I'd already applied for the college and got approved. So I knew I was leaving. So I got real smart, smart mouthy on the last couple of days. I told some people off a little bit that needed it. Well, good for you. Good. <laughs> I actually have something I was going to show you. I brought, I brought yeah. this in for a reason. This is Bob Mackey's book. It's called Unmistakably Mackey. And he signed this for me. And it says, to the amazing Wayne, love Bob. Wow. Wow. It's like one of my, are, one you, of my are, you still, uh, are you still in touch with him? He had a birthday last week. I actually, I text him, tweet him sometimes and talk, but this is the sheriff gown that she wore for the Oscars. Wait, can I see? There. I did all the fringes for this. Every fringe wow. in that gown I made them. So wow. every time I ran it, the first time I ran into Cher after this, I said, I made the fringes for you for your gown. That's why you won the Oscar. She said, well, here, have a peanut M&M. &M. <laughs> <laughs> so she gave me a peanut M&M &M for making the fringes. I thought that was very nice of her. So, but, I mean, you leave Dallas, you go yeah. to California, right. uh, you've, you enrolled in school. Um, did you have any odd jobs that you did uh, leading I, up to? I worked at uh, Universal Studios for one summer as a tour guide. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, I've never had a job. I've never worked. I've worked in show business my whole life. That's great. That's great. And I really, I, I look back and I'm thinking, what would I have done? I mean, I did the designing for a short period. I had my store in Beverly Hills. We opened a store with the help of Joanna Carson, which was Johnny, one of his wives. Mm -hmm. She was wonderful. She backed us a lot. And um, I, when Joan wore the dresses on The Tonight Show, we had so many orders that I took all of my, my workroom people off of other jobs just to do these to ship out. Mm -hmm. Then I found out you don't get paid for 180 days or whatever it was. And I was like, holy hell, we have this huge rent of this store one street over from Rodeo Drive on Camden. And expenses were high, and we had to declare bankruptcy, which was horrible. I didn't even have a credit card. But the store was in my name, so they were afraid that people would come after me. So I had to give the entire store up, which was horrible, horrible wow. experience. Well, how did you pick yourself up from that? I started dressing up and deciding to do Lacage. And that's what I did. I auditioned the same day I got the job and went to the Fountain Blue Hilton. 
I was in the Laurent room, which is the same room that Frank Sinatra and Judy Garland performed in. Mm -hmm. So that was an honor to start That's, that. And way. that was a great room. I mean, it, I'm sure it was a beautiful is. room. And uh, we lived right on Collins Avenue at Seacoast Towers East. So here we are, 18, 19 year old people living in the Seacoast Towers. And all the ladies are like, ah, you're visiting your grandmother? No, we live here. We're in a show. Well, can I get a ticket? Oh my God, I can still hear them. Can I get a ticket? Can I get a ticket? But it was, it was, that was a good way to start. And how long were you there with that group? A year and uh, four months, I believe. And then I, then we were supposed to go back to LA and the producer said, you'll come back as Dolly. I already have Marilyn. And I was mm -hmm. mad and I was, at first when you start, I think you're a little grander than you were, than you're gonna be later. Cause you learn to be a little more modest. I said, I'm not coming back unless I do Marilyn and Dolly. Cause I was a Marilyn, I was hitting in Miami. I want to be Marilyn. He goes, well, we have a Marilyn. So you, you're gonna have to just do Dolly. I said, I'm not gonna come back to work then. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was playing hardball. He called me three days before I was supposed to start. He said, make sure you have your Marilyn dress in your wig. Isn't it funny how that happens? And I was Marilyn Monroe in Hollywood. And that was an honor. I mean, an honor to do Marilyn in Hollywood. Well, let's talk about you going into the show at the, sure. fountain, I see it's falling. Uh, at the Fountain Blue. Um, yeah. It's one thing that you're doing what you've been doing and successfully. Um, but then all of a sudden you're no longer just you doing your show, you're part of an ensemble. What was that experience like? Was it an easy transition for you? Do you enjoy being a part of an I, ensemble? I really loved it. We were like a family. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, you can go to a, a gay bar and do a, a, a gig. You have to guard everything, an eyelash, a earring, a shoe. I mean, you never know if something's gonna disappear. I could have left a hundred dollar bill on my makeup station at Lacage. No one would have taken it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were like all like family. Mm -hmm. And I really still talk to some of them and we really we were still close. We've even talked about possible reunion. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know what that'll be like. <laughs> well, how many of you, I mean, are, are st from that show are still around? Um, uh, Gary D's in, Flor in, in New York doing shows oh in, uh, with uh, Stephen Andre in Atlantic City. Uh, 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 I'm just think uh, Brian... Uh, Brent Allen is is back in Palm Springs now. Oh my Gypsy's God! Gypsy's still living with a niece. She just names. retired, eighty nine. I mean, I got Christopher Morley who did Maryland before me. He's in L A. still. There's a lot of the people that are still, you know, not really doing as much as, mm -hmm. as I'm doing. I'm still doing. I was doing five nights a week before COVID started, plus extra gigs. So it's like. Well, you, let's busy. go there for a moment. What did your calendar look like um, when uh, you got, when did you first hear about COVID? Let's start there. And did you have any idea? I that did because my, my husband is a truck driver and he said, baby, he said, this is going to get bad. And he said, I don't know if you've heard about it on the news, but they're talking about this new virus. And I said, yeah, I've heard inklings about it. I don't know how serious it's going to get. He said, I think it's going to be bad. And I said, well, he goes, just, just go to the, go to Costco, go to the Kroger, because he said, I'm up in the East Coast and things are closing. And he said, I'm just warning you now. So I did exactly what he said. I loaded up the freezer. I loaded up the pantries. I even made a pantry in the bathroom that had a closet area, just stocked up on rice and, and things it would keep. And all of a sudden, sure enough, everything started really shutting down. And when it did shut down, it, it was overnight. It was quick. Mm -hmm. and they closed the bars immediately. And that's where I was doing three different bars a night, five nights a week. Wow. Wow. So I went down to nothing. So that's when I adopted to do my show at home because I figured, well, I can sing. I might as well just use this and sing. And I sing and people write me and say, oh, my God, I was crying. I was like, mm -hmm. wow. But they're home and they're, they're stuck at home. And all of a sudden you're singing, low hurts. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I well, love God it. bless you for doing this. And I, love when... it. I had somebody call me last night. Uh, you know, they can call on FaceTime and bring your mm -hmm. phone. And I answered it. I knew the name, but I wasn't sure. And he goes, I just want to tell you how much you've made my, when I was by, when I was home, stuck at home doing nothing. I was so depressed. You brought me joy and happiness. And I really want to thank you. I thought, what a nice thing for somebody to call and tell you. I mean, that's very nice. That's amazing. After, uh, the COVID shutdown and everything. How soon afterwards did you get started doing this or was it immediate for you? It was really, I saw somebody do one online and I didn't really understand because they just talked. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, hey, I've got my speakers. I've got my mixer. I've got my computer with all my songs, my tracks. Why not get on and just do a live show? So I talked to the apartments to make sure it was okay. 
And I set up here in my living room and just set everything up. It looked horrible on the other side, but on this side, I had my nano leaf lights on the wall and it looked really, you know, nice. And I just took, I took a tip, a, a, like a, a request songs, mm -hmm. or I'd make a list of what I was going to sing. And I changed my mind and said, oh, I don't like this. We're going to sing this one. <laughs> and, and, and really everybody loves it. And I tell stories and mm -hmm. I mean, I really do like it. I like, I like doing it at home because you're not having to get, get out and get in your car and schlep somewhere else. And it's just, it's and our audience is just finding you because you're out there doing it or well, are... I, I do ads on Facebook and I put it on, on Instagram and things saying, Hey guys, if you're not busy, this is where I am. And there's PayPal and Venmo. If you want to tip, you don't have to, but come watch it. If you feel like tipping great, if you can't, I understand. Cause I couldn't, <laughs> I'm broke. Now, how has this year uh, impacted you beyond the obvious? We all know what we've all gone through and everything. How has it changed you, either for the better or for the worse? I think a little bit for the worse because I don't have much faith in my fellow man anymore, not as a whole. We're so divided. It's so sad. And I, to me, this virus doesn't care who you voted for. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care who you're going to vote for next time. It's still going to get you. And I love the people that are saying, oh, it's just a hoax. Uh, no, I've had people die. And that's not a hoax. And they just try to say, well, they already had complications or something like that. That really kind of pisses me off and makes me angry. Mm -hmm. But then you have to sit back and say, wait a minute. You have to think on your own terms. I did what I was supposed to do. Even when I went back to the club, I'm, I'm eight to 10 feet away from people. I have them send uh, text messages for their songs. They don't come to the booth to ask me what song. The tip is done through Venmo or PayPal on the screen, or there is a tip jar. They can put the money. I come home and put it in a sanitizer right away. I spray paper towels with Lysol, hand it to them. They wipe the microphone after every use. So I try to keep everybody as safe as I can. And if they don't want to do that, they don't get You've gone back to live performing. Yeah, yeah, I've gone back to the club. I've been back now for, uh, I can't remember exactly. They opened clubs here to 50%. And that's mm -hmm. when they asked me if I would do it. I said, only if you, you will barricade the stage off, make put a rope up, a bungee, where people can't get to me and do it my way or I will not come back. Mm -hmm. So I've been very very lucky. I haven't heard of anybody getting sick and coming back and saying, oh my God, I got sick COVID oh, from, from your show. But you also are at a position because you've got the gravitas, you've got the body of worth, as I call it, behind you, that you're able to make those decisions. For a lot of people, you know, right now here in New York, where I am, uh, yeah. there are, uh, you know, all the smaller clubs. The other night, Jerry Seinfeld appeared at the Gotham Comedy Club. Uh, I don't know if that made national news or not. I didn't hear about it. No, I didn't know it. Uh, but it did. And that was, you know, a baby step in the right direction. I want to ask that you. Club? Does that club hold a lot of people? or? Um, I think that on a, a, a full night, it would hold 160 people. Okay. So it's had, not a huge venue. That's what I'm no, wondering. No, it's not a huge about. venue. That's why, you know, but I want to ask you prior to COVID, um, do you consider yourself a political person or an activist? Richard, I'm going to tell you something. I'm almost ashamed to tell you this. I only registered to vote this last time. I never really thought my vote mattered. I just didn't care. And this time it hit hard. And I thought mm -hmm. there's no way that we can have another four years of this. I just can't. I can't even imagine it. I never turned mm -hmm. off CNN or, or TV just to know what was going to happen, what was going to blow up next. And now it's so nice. I don't have to turn on the news anymore, really. I don't care. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, I really was not political. I really wasn't. I was ashamed to tell people, but I said, I registered to vote. And by God, I got out and wore that sticker proudly. And, Good for you. And I was it doesn't matter, that. you know, that it took you a while to get there. The matter is that it got you there. Yeah, and it did. So. It just finally made me mad. Mm -hmm. And it's, you just, I just can't, like I said earlier about the disease and COVID and, and the, how political they made this, this, this virus. It's insane. The, the, the strength this guy has over these people. I don't know what it is. I don't know. But I, I think I might watch Schindler's, Schindler's List and I have to get some ideas. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, you know, I left home when I was 18 years old to come to New York. Um, you know, and I also left saying goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. But you went back to Texas. What brought you back? I have some family here. I have my sister and some nieces and nephews. And, and plus, I had a lot of people when I left. Ben and I decided, I went to do a, a wedding, a lesbian wedding in Akron, which is, should be a country song. But I did a <laughs> wedding up there. And everybody kept saying, oh, my God, you need to come to, to Columbus. We have like 18 bars. They would love you there. Oh, my God. And I thought everybody in Dallas had seen everything I could sing. And it was boring. I was old hat. And I told Ben, why don't we move? He said, okay. 
So we moved to Columbus, got there and found out it's 85% lesbian, 10% gay, and the other 10 are somewhere. We don't know where. <laughs> so it was really sad. So and how long have you been out of the out of the state than in the state? So we ended up staying there for a while. And everybody can say, when are you coming back? And one day Ben called and said, baby, do you think it's time to move back? And as soon as he said the word back, I said, yes. I didn't wait for him to say Texas. And so I got on Facebook and I said, who would hire me in Texas? And so he said, you need to talk to Randy Norman. He owns a new club. And he all of a sudden Randy said, hi, Wayne. I went, where, where did he see this? I'm in an 18 wheeler going down the road. <laughs> and he asked me to do two nights. And then his friend, another two nights, and it just started rolling. And I came back to a sold out comeback show and, and I've been busy ever since. That's great. Now, how long have you and Ben been together? We've been married 14, almost 14, well, 14 years is coming this January. So over 13 years, but we knew each other. He says it was a year. I think he started talking marriage on our third date. Wow. And how did you meet? I was doing a show and he came in with some owner, an owners of another nightclub here. They were trying to fix him up with one of their managers and he didn't really like him. And I was dressed as Cher and I was doing a live internet show that I did with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. We did a movie review. Guess how we did the ratings of movies? High heel up or high heel down? It's kind of cute. So we did our I, like it. I think doing the show and back. he walked by and I thought, oh God, don't let him be straight and don't let him like his own kind. Because sometimes the big <laughs> guys like big guys. Mm -hmm. So he stopped talk, started talking to me and we talked and talked. I went in the dressing room because I had one there. Got out of makeup to make sure he knew I didn't live like that. We started talking. We kissed. And he asked me to dinner the next night. And we had dinner at a restaurant here called Green Papaya. And that's the restaurant where he later proposed to me at. So, so it's our little place. But I that's found out wonderful. he'd given up a trip that next day to stay in De Texas to take me out to dinner. That's wonderful. So well, you know, I have a dear friend, Sue Matsuki. She will either be watching this live or later. Um, and she just recently wrote an article. My uh, husband and I have been legally wed going on 10 years now. Uh, but we've been together 31 years. Um, oh. So, and I always so say, lucky. no, I always say that when he gets to the pearly gates, St. Peter is going to say, here's your purple heart because you certainly have earned it. Um, <laughs> because I know I feel that no, it's not easy living with a performer. Um, no. Let's face it. I mean, those no. both parties are in the business. Um, mm. My heart goes out to both of them. But what's your secret? I mean, obviously, he loves what you do. Uh, he is in a completely different profession. So there's no competition there. But what do you attribute the success to your relationship? I think the main thing that keeps us together is the share room, a two-room apartment. And that <laughs> room is the share room. It is not to spill out into the other parts of the house. <laughs> he just does not like it. He's ex-military, Israeli and American. Wow. And he's a truck driver. He's six foot five. He looks like Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's a great big, big, big bear. He loves mm -hmm. me. And he's just, he's proud of me. But the first thing he said to me that almost nixed the whole deal is he was not a sheriff fan. And I was like, I'm thinking in my head, oh my God. <laughs> and then he, then he saved it by saying the magic words, I do love Wayne Smith as Cher. And I went, okay. Has he become a sheriff fan? Not really. Okay. Mean, he's okay. He doesn't hate her or nothing, but he's he's not real gay. I mean, he really mm -hmm. is not. I had, Whatever that I means. had people come up to me and ask me, Richard, are you sure Ben's gay? I said, I am positive <laughs> he's gay. Ben's gay. <laughs> there it is. By the way, anybody who's watching, Ben is gay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go back to your early days in Los Angeles. I mean, obviously you had the store. You went to Florida. Uh, when you... You were in Florida for, again, how long? About a year and four months, I believe it was. I'm pretty sure. And then when that ended, did you, did you go back to L.A.? Did you go to Immediately. Texas? Oh, yeah, because that was my home. I mean, I was going back home. I had an apartment. My nephew was going to work with my brother at Cedar Sinai Medical Center. So he mm -hmm. kept the apartment, took care of everything, and made sure everything was, you know, fine while I was gone. Because I knew it wasn't a long-term thing. We weren't going to be there forever. The contract with the, with the, with the a fair, a Fountain Blue wasn't uh, long. And you're doing Lacage in California. Right. Uh, while you're doing this show, I mean, were you absolutely comfortable in what you were doing or were you looking at bigger dreams down no, the path? Lacage was, Lacage was as big as it got. There was no RuPaul drag race where all the queens, you know, tried to say they were going to be on there and be the star. Lacage was the deal. You could go in a nightclub and say you're a Lacage star. They'd move you up to the front of the line to do a number. 
I mean, you were treated treated incredible. We did parties for Wolfgang Puck at his restaurants, and he would, mm -hmm. he would treat us to food when we left, bring us up in a Rolls limousine. I mean, he really, it was incredible. And all the stars came to the show. So it's like mm -hmm. I made friends with every. I lived next door to Estelle Getty for six years. She was mm -hmm. my. I, I miss her every day like family. I miss her so much, and she she just she's one of my one of my sweethearts. I couldn't watch the show for a long time when she passed away. You know, how you, you can't watch videos of family. It's right. hard to watch it when they pass. I couldn't watch Golden Girls. And the first time I watched it, I cried, but I, I laughed, but I cried. Now, are you friends with Michael Orland as well, who was also I, very good? I don't really know Michael, I don't think. I did an interview with him, and he also was very good friends with Estelle Getty, uh, which speaks volumes about her. Yeah. Um, and But I want to ask you, when you were doing Lacage and then beyond that, did you consider yourself um, ambitious? Or did a lot of opportunities come your way? You know what? I was very lucky. I was lucky. Just like the TV shows, producers would come in and, and ask me to audition. And it was like, I'd go audition. And by the time I got home, it was already on my voicemail that I got the part. I got everything I went for except for one. I was supposed to be, um, uh, what's her name? Um, uh, shit, uh, the one that was on uh, uh, 222, uh, shit, uh, Jack A. I was supposed to be mm -hmm. her, her, her son. Well, I'm not the right shade. So that didn't work out. <laughs> Even the producer when I watched it, I know your work, you're excellent, but I, I don't think you could pass for her, her son. And when did the she had a white, why did she have a white husband? Yes. I but when, did, when did the first television appearance come along? I was on my camera on on uh, my camera with Stacy Keach, and we filmed at the Burbank Studios on the back lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had my own trailer with my name on it, and everything. it was so cool. And uh, we did the show, and that's when I went to open the show in Florida. So I flew to Florida. They needed me to come back to do a scene of me in a body bag because I got shot in the streets. And they flew me back, and they'd already signed me up for SAG, which I didn't even know you couldn't. I thought Screen Actors it was no big deal. We were, there's something called a, a, a Tapley. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called, Tapley something. Anyway, yeah, let, let you work for like a month without it. But they paid for my Screen Actors Guild card. So I was a member of SAG. So when I came back, they'd fly me first class, put me in a nice hotel, pay me to eat, everything, just to lay in a body bag. <laughs> and then go back to Florida. And that, my friends, is show business in a nutshell. Yeah, I was in a body bag before I even died. So since you first got started in this business, um, the business has changed a lot, obviously, as everything has. Uh, what are the things that you love uh, that have changed in the business that you truly embrace? And what are some of the changes that you absolutely uh, dislike? And what do you miss the most about those early days of your career? The early days of my career, I miss stars, movie stars, not not actors or singers, movie stars. I mean, I would go to the list every day to check it out. And it, when it said Lucille uh, McGillica, uh, no, uh, Lucille, uh, Lucille Gary, Morton. Gary Gordon, Morton, Lucille and, and Gary Morton. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God. Then it said one night it said Elton John's coming or somebody else is in the book. Every night somebody came to that show. And I was starstruck when I first got to LA anyway, because I'd already met Debbie Reynolds and Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft and different people, I had lunches and dinners with them. And I was like, I'd call my mother, I said, Mother, I'm having dinner with Milton Burl. She'd say, What? <laughs> she actually was in the hospital once. And I had all these people sign a get well card. We, we, we did a thing at the Friars Club for Martha Ray when she was inducted, wow. which usually was all men, but they inducted her. Mm -hmm. And her nickname was Maggie. And she used to come to our show and, and order us Dom champagne. They send Andres in charge her for Dom. And she found out and hit the roof. Wow. Well, but I don't like, remember. But I had her, Jimmy Stewart, Bob Hope, everybody signed for my mom and sent her a good well card. And Joanne Worley wrote, happy birthday, Clara, because she was so cuckoo. <laughs> I was starstruck. Look at this. I brought this to show you, too. This is something you might enjoy. I waited for a long time for this in front of Tower Records. Miss oh Betty Davis signed. And I had her write, but you are Blanche, because I said, Will you please say the line from Baby Jane? She said, how did I say that? I said, but you are, Blaine. Look how she signed under the R. Yeah. Like she yelled it. And I was with a guy named Jerry at the time, which I hate having that on there, but still. And then- Well, and I, then, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I have that album. <laughs> yep. But I bet nobody has, but you are Blanche on it. That's right. That's right. And then I got, got this it. from Barbara Eden. Wow. And she signed my Barbie. Wow. That's she, great. she was doing the odd couple, which was female version in Atlantic City. So With we had the whole week off to pay. So I flew back to be, see my family and flew back the last night of her show and saw it and brought my doll. 
So getting back to the first part of that question, what are the changes that you really don't like about the business? And what are some of the things that you really uh, love that have changed since you first got started? What I love the most is the freedom to, for people to express what they believe and what they what they want to show people and, and don't have to hide it. Mm -hmm. I love that fact. And then the double-edged sword, the people that put on lip gloss and a slip and no pantyhose and think that they're a real woman and they just get up and just lip sync to anything. I want people to do a craft and remind me of somebody, a star, a celebrity, and take me back to that that period or whatever that, that illusion should be. I just think drag's becoming very loose. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the, the fright drag, I just can't, I, I don't, I mean, they've got their place, but it's not for me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is, is changing a lot. Do you think that shows like RuPaul's Drag Race have helped the industry or hurt it? It's done a little of both. It's done a little of both because I think everybody thinks that that's real. Mm -hmm. And I've lived the business. I've lived with, with shows where you're all backstage together. And a lot of that stuff is for TV sake. It's for ratings. That's basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't know. I, I think a lot of that. I, I actually stopped watching it about the third or fourth season. I just. Don't really watch well, it. I'll tell you from my own point of view is that, uh, you know, I'm all about celebrating. Um, I have, you know, I was in this business as well for 20 years. Um, I've shared dressing rooms with everybody and I've never seen the backbiting, the bitchiness, all of that that is portrayed on television. And again, I realize it's for ratings and for sensationalism, but that's not the business that I knew. Yeah, m me either. I agree with you hundred percent. Now, were there, uh, are there um, either past or present, uh, those in this profession that you really idolize uh, that have been uh, mentors to you in terms of the work that you do or that you aspire to do? Yeah, I, 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 I look back at everybody and because everybody says, did you have a drag mother? No, I didn't. Paul Maurice was the guy at Lacage who would help you when you first started with your makeup how to do certain mannerisms and just a little bit. He was a, kind of like a coach and he was really a good guy and I, he was really nice. But look, looking back at everything, I would look more at pictures of Elgin, John Kenna, Elgin Kenna, who traveled with Cher. I look at more pictures of Elgin than I do Cher sometimes to get ideas of what mm -hmm. to do. And I've been blessed and honored and, and over like overblown by somebody coming up and saying, aren't you Elgin Kenna? I'm like, <laughs> wow. I think uh, Wayne's uh, froze for a moment, but uh, uh, we'll give it a second, see if he kicks back in. This happens, folks. Um, so Wayne, you're frozen. Um, if you can uh, hear me, uh, you can actually close out and come back in and that will help. There you are. There you are. Uh -oh. You froze for a moment. So you yeah. said that some people mistake you for, or they- Elgin, and I was absolutely honored. I mean, it only happened a couple, three times, but it, when it ever happened, I was just like, wow, you've done your makeup okay tonight, girl. That's what I tell myself. That was, it was an honor, but I love, I love him. And anytime I'm online and he talks or says something to me, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. Now you've impersonated Dolly, Marilyn, Cher is what you've become known for. Mm -hmm. um, why Cher uh, did you devote more time to her than either of the other two? I think because I, well, it's not even that. I mean, I did Cher and Dolly for over eight years before I ever started doing Cher. Mm -hmm. But it's just when Cher became able for me to, to, to do my share, it was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I get to wear those clothes. I get to wear to that, those songs. And it, that just, it just blended with me. And I'm lucky enough that my voice, I can turn it on really easily. It's like, mm -hmm. honey, I can just be Cher. I have to be. I can't do this all the time. But by God, I can. It's like it just comes out. And I'm very lucky. Was it that. easy Was it easy to develop that voice? Yeah, or Pretty much, yeah. I went to the state fair once, Richard, and I sang uh, Desperado by the Eagles. And they gave me mm -hmm. a cassette tape when I got done. That shows you how long ago this was. And I came home <laughs> and was playing it. My mother said, is that Cher's new song? I said, no, mother, that's me. And I thought to myself, well, she thought that was Cher. I could tweak it just a little bit. And sure enough, I could tweak it enough that it, it ends up working. Mm -hmm. I, and love, I love being able to sing. Oh, yeah. Has she, she loved it. Perform? She loved it. 
she came to Atlantic City when I was there. So my, my dad was already passed at the time. And she wow. stayed for like two months. I had a two-room suite. And I'd hear her leaving in the night to go to the slot machines. I'd hear the key go, where are you going? I think that machine's calling me. She just went down and started gambling. Cher? No, my, my mother. Oh, you're talking oh, about no, Cher? No, no, I asked if Cher had seen you perform. She's, she knows of me. And I don't think she's ever seen the shows. I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't have time to ever do all that stuff. But she knows who I am for sure. I actually... When Believe was introduced to America, it was a hit in 23 countries or 26 countries. They knew it was going to be big. Warner Brothers did. But uh, she was filming a movie called Tea with Mussolini. So she was in Europe. Oh, yes. And she, she couldn't do well. the promos for it. And so they needed somebody to go to the nightclubs and promote the song. And so they had me go to the shows and do it. And they had security guards around me. And the people mm -hmm. would be screaming. I'd be like, honey, you're going to die of a heart attack. Girls, just have a good time, bitch. And they, just, they were screaming. They just thought it was Cher. So it was really that was really an honor. Now, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about this genre of the business? Which which genre do you mean? Uh, female impersonation. Well, I, I think a lot of people think that we eat, sleep, dream, and breathe it. And when I come home, I get out of it in less than eight minutes. I use Albaline and wipes with no alcohol. I'm out of it, <laughs> go jump in the shower, wash my hair, and I'm basically weighing again. And it's like... Mm -hmm. I could never have had Ben if I lived like this. He would never have married me. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have my That's life true. that I have now. So, I mean, I, I think a lot of people do believe that we live like that. I have people all the time on Facebook wanting to be a friend. As soon as I'm a friend, so how can we get together? And I'm like, oh, bye, unfriend. This is not why I get on. I Facebook. know. <laughs> I get on Facebook to promote my shows and to mm -hmm. tell people where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. And sometimes share a part of my life, you know, things that happen. Like today, I shared where I went for lunch. <laughs> Well, you bring up a very interesting point. I mean, obviously, uh, the last year has been beneficial for you on many levels, being able to do it this way. Uh, but how has social media, let's talk prior to the pandemic, how has it impacted your life? Um, how, what have you embraced and what do you hate about social media? I, 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 I hate the politics of it but I was guilty of doing it too, right at the end. Mm -hmm. Right before the election, I was on there saying stuff every day. So I can't say anything, but I don't, I think it just divided so many people. And that's the sad part. As mm -hmm. far as the good, I'm able to tell people where I'm at. And I, these people have seen me at these clubs, they know where I'm at, but they just have to be reminded, spoon fed, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just have, they just, I'm here on Wednesdays, I'm here on Fridays, and I'm here on Saturdays. The shows all start at 9.30, they end at two. So you have to just keep reminding them. And I've, I've done very well with that. Yeah, you know, those of us who are in this business, we, uh, I mean, you don't live, eat, and breathe dressed as share, but we do pretty much live, eat, and breathe this business. Oh, uh, you, you have to. You or have it'll, to. It'll, it'll steamroll over you. Uh, it'll steamroll right over you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, what do you do in what I call the white spaces? on your calendar. If you saw the documentary on Joan Rivers, if there was a blank space on her calendar, she panicked. She thought she would never work again. And she was, I was lucky enough, God bless her, I saw her two weeks before she passed away. Um, really hysterical at the top of her game. And then this tragedy happened. But do you have white space on your calendar as well? Are you well, able to just now, shut down? Especially now with, with the with the virus, I have a lot of white space. But Skipper, I, Mr. Skipper, I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> I lay on the couch and watch movies. I play, I'm a horrible, I just got into gaming. I really love games, but I play Jurassic World Evolution mm -hmm. on the big 85 inch TV that my husband got me instead of going to see the, the inauguration. And uh, I really, do, I love my downtime. I love it. And I'll sometimes sit in rhinestone something or, you know, work on something. But I love my white space, actually. But it's like, that's, that's, that's just me. And what advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue this as a career? Make sure you absolutely love it. And if you don't absolutely love it, do not invest the money or the time because it is expensive and it is not cheap. I have thousands of dollars worth of makeup on my table. You go in there and look, you can't even believe how much I've got. Lipsticks alone, I probably have $2,000 worth of lipstick. And it's like, some of them I don't even like, but I buy a matte color thing. Oh, I like it. I get home, I'm like, I don't like it. But it's like, it's really expensive. It takes time. It takes, the wigs are expensive. Everything, everything about it. it it's, I've got a jewelry rack from floor to ceiling in there. 
I've got more jewelry than I could ever wear in a million years, but it takes a lot of money. And I tell people all the time, don't just watch RuPaul and say, oh, I'm going to do that. No, you're not going to do that. It's not that easy. These queens have been in there a long time, mm -hmm. uh, getting everything down to the fine tip tooth comb. You can't just step up and like, ta-da! No, <laughs> you're going to be the wah, 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 girl. Mm -hmm. just, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. So what was the biggest um, hurdle that you have had to face in your life? I know that you mentioned earlier bankruptcy. That's a major hurdle. Uh, uh, I had, a, I had a, a bad scare in Aruba. I got bit by a mosquito and I got encephalitis and I couldn't walk for a year. I was in a wheelchair. And if you get encephalitis, it can go one way or two way, uh, two ways. It can kill you or you get better. And your brain, it's, it's according to what part of the brain it affects. And it affected my equilibrium. I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk. I had to learn to walk again. My mother was crying one day. She goes, you just don't walk like Wayne anymore. And I'll never forget that. Mm. And then right after that, I got a show to, to do in, in Europe, in Vienna. And I went to went to Europe and did Dolly, Sharon, and Marilyn, all three. How, how long after being diagnosed with encephalitis were you able to work again? It was about almost close to a year, eight months to a year. Now, scary. obviously you, you have to, as you said earlier, you have to love what you're doing. Yeah. What, what keeps Wayne Smith going in this business? Ben, my husband, he, he keeps me focused and he really, he's proud of me. He really is proud of me and he takes care of me and he's nine years younger. So I guess I've got that part of share too. Like, oh. <laughs> That's good. And if you could go back to any period that you've lived through, um, in your career, mm -hmm. and I'm talking specifically career, what period would you like to relive again and why? Lacage with all the celebrities and all the fun. And that was the beginning. It was just, it was so exciting. Like the night we had Milton Burrow's birthday party. Every, every camera, every news station was parked out front. You had to be really something to cross the border and get in the, in the room. And that's the night I got Lucille Ball's autograph on a big picture of my, my house. And that, that was, the, that was just a magical time. I did TV. It was on the top of, it was just the top of the world. Now, has there ever been a period, I mean, you've been very, very fortunate. You're one of the few in this business uh, who is, I mean, I'm tomorrow, and I'll give a plug for this now, I'm going to be interviewing Rutanya Alda, who wrote the book, The Mommy Dearest Diaries. Oh, cool, uh, yeah. And tells all about our experiences working on the film, A Mommy Dearest. Uh, How fun is that? But she is one of those actresses uh, she calls herself uh, part of the 95%. She's part of that 95% of working actresses. There's only 1% who are like the Michelle Pfeiffer's of the world. And oh, the yeah. Get, 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 get and everything. Get auditioning. Uh, but you have been fortunate enough to make a living at this. Has there been a lean period in your career, excluding the past year, of course? Not really. I really have been very, very, very lucky. I really have. And even like when I got the encephalitis, I worked on something that became something that was another chapter in my life. This is another thing I was going to show you. This is a book that I wrote and illustrated for Neiman Marcus. It's called Star Babies. Is it and available? It, 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 now you can get it on Amazon. And these are the toys that went with it and everything was designed. And they're little babies, so they have little butts. But they were, it's a story about falling I've stars. I've got to have my own star baby. And where they go when they fall from the sky. And, and Estelle Getty signed my introduction for my book. And at the time she said, I'm not a children's book expert. I said, I, it would mean a lot to me. And now that she's gone, I just got goosebumps all up and down my arms. That's weird. Well, she's watching. She's watching. That's really weird. I have them everywhere. That's nice. But she, she, I just, like I said, she just, she loved it and believed in me. So that was really, that's something I did when I was sick. And I just sketched these ugly, ugly things. And when I, my mind got better, I got on the computer, started drawing it. My sister sat with me and we, we came up with this book and it sold to Neiman Marcus. We sold 67,000 toys and two printings of the book. And it's available now on Amazon. You can find it on Amazon probably for like a buck. <laughs> I sold all the rights to everything and bought a big house where my mother would have a place to live with her kids the last years of her life. And, and So you don't get any proceeds or anything from the book right now? Not anymore now. I sold everything to get that house for my family. Wow. Wow. You've made some really great decisions in your career. Eh, and dumb ones. But you know what? <laughs> we all have those moments, Richard. Yeah. My father was offered a job one time at a hotel casino. And my father said, who's going to gamble in a hot damn desert? It would have been the Horseshoe Hotel in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas. That's, he turned that down. 
Wow. Wow. Well, I can't believe this, but we are at the end of our show. You and are wonderful talking to you. No, well, don't go anywhere yet. I, I just want to, first of all, thank everybody for being here. Um, if you enjoyed the show today, please, 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 if you haven't done so already, subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, Richard Skipper Celebrates, which is most likely where you're watching this right now. By subscribing, what that does is it elevates me to another level. Once I get to a thousand subscribers and I'm close to it, then it positions me in a completely different way uh, with uh, YouTube and the work that I'm doing. And again, I'm all about celebrating artists and getting their word out there. Getting well, we will, We're going to post on my Facebook today for all well, my girls, all my boys <laughs> to subscribe. So I've got 5,000 people. If I can get half of those people to do it, you're set. Uh, and it's wonderful. And I wish that I could, you know, anytime you need me, I'm going to be there for you. I want to let everyone know, uh, once again, that if you are around tomorrow night at six o'clock, Ritanya Alda is going to tell all, and we're going to sit and we're going to chat about her career, uh, her childhood, uh, amazing her childhood coming to this country um, the life that she led uh, for the first 20 years of her life, more exciting than any movie that she could have possibly ever done. Um, I also end every show uh, by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. What I want you all to do is to go to your Facebook friends list and the fifth name that pops up, reach out to that person with a phone call to let them know what they mean to you. Did you see CBS Sunday morning yesterday morning? I didn't. What was it? Well, they did an interview with Hunter Biden. And Hunter oh, Biden I heard said, it was going to happen, but I didn't even set it to take Every it. night, his father, the president of the United States, calls him and his grandchildren to tell them that he loves them. Because he knows what it's like to have loss in his life. And oh, yes. all these people that are watching right now, that we love, we don't have the promise that we're going to have to be able to do that tomorrow. Okay. So today, the fifth person, that's just one person, call that person and let them know what they mean in your life. As my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. You never know what someone else is going through. And Wayne, I'm going to give you the final word. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now, this is your platform. And before you speak, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world and that you will continue to give. Thank you. And my love to Ben as thank well. Thank you very much. I will, I promise. I just want to tell everybody, I say this on my wind down every night. I always say, be good to each other. We're all we have, but now I've changed it. I say it. Be good to each other. That's what Joe would want. So everybody, please be nice. Be nice to a stranger. Just say, hey, your, your dress is pretty. Or, hey, I like your hair. Say something to somebody that you don't even know. It makes you, them feel good, and it makes you feel good for doing it. And that's just my yeah. advice. I do it all the time. I yeah. don't sometimes get a thank you, but you know what? I don't care. I'm overly nice to people because it makes you feel better. Thank you. And it makes but, you healthier. And it makes you healthier. <laughs> Love you, Wayne. You're the right, best. Good Goodbye, baby. I'll see you later. Thank you so much, Richard, for this opportunity. Thank you. Goodbye, Bye -bye. everybody. Thank you.